Guys from that team, I'm thinking as they do this travel, but this morning we get a unique opportunity. It's my privilege to introduce to you um, our sister in the faith, Kristen Huffman. Now many of you know Kristen because she's spoken at Access before, either as a learning lab or on a Sunday morning. Uh, Kristen uh, has also been active in, in many different discussions that we've had. And um, a couple of things that you may not know about her, she is... Uh, she has a role at Fuller, Texas, uh, Fuller Seminary, Texas, where she serves as Director of Strategic Engagement. I got my phone out because I want to make sure I got that title right. I'm not sure exactly what Director of Strategic Engagement means, but uh, I think it's a pretty cool title, and you can ask her about it later. Um, <laughs> She is also an Associate Director of Frontier Fellowship, which is a mission to the unreached in Houston and across the world. So that's taking her across the globe to visit many places that, uh, that you'll want to ask her about as well. So I encourage you to hang out, meet Kristen afterwards if you get a chance. She's a friend of our congregation, a dear friend of ours, and uh, I'm really happy that she gets to kick off this Sunday message for us. Over the next several weeks, we will be talking about the topic of worship how to get engaged in worship more deeply, and she's the perfect person to, to kick off this series for us. So could you give her a warm welcome? A warm access welcome. Kristen, welcome. We're glad to have you. Thanks. Thanks, and it's really fun to be here, and I don't know what my title means either, so... We've been trying to figure that out <clears throat> all year. But it is a ton of fun, and I get to go around and, and uh, make uh, build relationships with churches and pastors and alumni and nonprofits and all of that. It's just it's been really fun. It's working out with Michael at, at Fuller and the whole team there, Michael Murray, some of you know him, and Denise. Anyway, it's been a blessing. But I'm happy to be here with you again, and I want to open with a word of prayer. Let's pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So I don't know if Ted is crazy or not to invite a stranger to come and introduce his series, but... Um, but we're going to go with it. And so, the you know, as he said, the theme is going to be worship for the next number of weeks. And I will be providing an introduction. And, oh, my gosh, I could go a lot of different directions. So I'm going to go in all of them. No, I'm kidding. You know, when I was in seminary, we talked about the person who gave the porcupine sermon, which is too many points. I'm hoping that that doesn't happen today. But you could do that. And the whole topic of worship is very... It's both simple and complicated all at the same time. But I want to uh, tell you that as I worked on this message, and we'll see how this goes. I have a bunch of slides, and maybe they'll work, maybe they won't. But I started thinking about worship and praying about worship and looking stuff up about worship. And the first place that I am started was with my own experience. And so there I am, the little one. And that's Easter Sunday with my big sister and my dad. And we were all dressed up to go to worship. And I attended an Episcopal church, and it was formally, it was formal worship. Of course, this was in the 50s. So we wore hats. My mother made hats for us to wear to worship. So it was a different kind of worship, and so we went. Then the next slide is worship in Ethiopia. As Ted said, I do get to travel to go to places where the gospel has never been heard. In this tribe, there are pockets of Christians, but then there are the people who live out in the villages who've never heard the word. This is in one of the cities. And so it was a different style of worship for me. Um, the next one is also in Ethiopia, and I'm in my Ethiopian dress, and I am serving communion with my host, Orgissa. So I got to participate in worship and to lead worship in a language I did not know. So I led in English and had a translator. That's an experience. The next one, oops, yeah, here you go. They told me, they warned me about this. Okay, this is in Guatemala. I also served with a team, a medical mission team in Guatemala, and this is out um, a church there, a very formal Catholic church. And our worship takes place in, in a yard, in a, a very casual place. We wear just our scrubs for, for the medical team. But this is what happens for them in Guatemala. And the final uh, slide, 
is Cave Church in Garbage City in Cairo, Egypt. And they weren't meeting at this moment. <clears throat> Am I fading out occasionally? Anyway, and so that's a whole different style of worship. Garbage City is a place where the Christians have collected the garbage from the city and brought it um, and to repurpose it, actually. But they have church there, and it's an amazing place to gather for worship. So as I started thinking about all of just my personal experience, and you all come from some place, and you have a personal experience. So I started thinking about worship styles, worship venues, <clears throat> worship traditions, worship wars, as they say. So what is worship anyway? Merriam-Webster Dictionary, um, online anyway, says that worship is reverence offered a divine being or supernatural power. Also, an act of expressing such reverence. <clears throat> it's the reverence itself it's the act of expressing it, and it's a form of religious practice with its creed and ritual. Number three, it's extravagant respect or admiration for or devotion to an object of esteem. And one of the examples I gave was worship of the dollar. All right. So Christian worship, um, this a reverent honor and homage given to God through prayer, singing, fellowship, um, preaching, meditation, silence, listening, participating in the sacraments. All of these things are part of worship. Sometimes we get it mixed up and think that we're just going to have worship now, which is the singing part. And yes, indeed, that is part of worship. But this whole thing is worship. And uh, so it's amazing that uh, we get to come together to offer our hearts in worship. And yes, we are to worship individually and quietly and alone. That's a very important part of aspect of worship. But there's something that happens when we come together and worship as one. Worship. All right. Worship, there's so many different scripture passages, and I know that in the next weeks you will visit a lot of these, but I just want to start with a couple of them. Psalm 100, shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Let me read that again. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. What a great intro into worship. This is the Lord God Almighty and we get to come and enter his presence. And then in Deuteronomy 6 in the Old Testament, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and all your strength. These commandments I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. That's happening right now in those Sunday school rooms. Um, Press them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them to your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your house and on your gates. We can just go on forever. Gosh, Psalm 96. Here, oh wait, sorry. Oh, shoot. Let's just go on. God doesn't want me to do that one. <laughs> Romans 12. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your, your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Revelation 4.11, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. My goodness, I just got lost in all these passages of scripture and all this research I was doing and, and why we worship and what we worship and even what happens when we don't worship the living God. As a Tozer said in the 1940s, before we had worship teams and theater lights and, and cushioned pews, 
He said this, it is certainly true that hardly anything is missing from our churches these days, except, and I would just say sometimes, the most important thing. We are missing genuine and sacred offering of ourselves and our worship to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Even in the 40s, when we thought church was kind of strong or getting stronger, there was a sense in which something was missing. We do sometimes have a sense that we don't worship well. We don't worship truly, and we don't worship the living God. I've had that nagging sense in my own life, <clears throat> Excuse me, and I've come to a realization of a couple of things. One is that sometimes, to be honest, I haven't truly worshipped God. Number two, I've actually worshipped other things. And then the third thing coming from those two is I believe that worship is about the state of my heart and what I adore. So today, as an intro into this season these, of, of the theme of worship, I'm going to talk about our heart condition. So I'm going to use a strange passage from Daniel the book of Daniel, which the whole thing is that book is kind of strange, but it's a crazy story full of strong personalities, human flaws, incredible choices, sin, miracles, and above all, the power of God Almighty. It's not just an exciting story, but it's a way to look at the state of our hearts and some of the challenges of heart that we face even today. So what do we have in the story? Well, around 605 BC, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon invaded Israel. And through a series of, of battles and this war, finally in 587, defeated Jerusalem and took the exile into captivity. Daniel was one of them, and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, first two chapters of Daniel, which I offer to you as an amazing story of God's power and grace and our human sin and frailty, um, talks about these four and how they resist the temptation to adapt to their culture and give up their true worship of God. And Daniel, with the help of the others, interpreted one of King Nebuchadnezzar's dreams, disturbing dreams, um, introducing him to the power of God Almighty. Now, Nebuchadnezzar didn't actually worship God himself, but he did observe that God had power. And so we enter into Daniel chapter 3. Oh, wait, I'm missing a whole bunch. Something didn't come through. That's okay. Let me just. I had all the passage written out, so it must be hiding in the. Um, so let's see, where are we, where are we? Mm -hmm, sorry, I was depending on slides. You should never depend on technology. Okay. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold 90 feet high and 9 feet wide and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. He then summoned the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image he had set up. So the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial office officials gathered for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before it. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, This is what you are commanded to do, <clears throat> O people, nations, and men of every language. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into the blazing furnace. Those were the instructions that he gave. Oh my gosh. Therefore, oh, these are the, um, therefore, oh wait, I'm sorry. 
Then the herald loudly proclaimed, nations and peoples of every language, this is what you are commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. I love those things. And I, I look, those are the four things, the, the pipes, the zither, the horn, the flute, the lyre, the harp. It doesn't have everything, but I thought I couldn't find a better picture for that, but whatever. So then they, so he repeats this, he repeats this and keeps going. All right. So uh, the next part is that their tattletales come along, the Chaldeans. All right. At this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, may the king live forever. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold, and that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into the blazing furnace. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now, when you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Okay. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, this is frustrating, you're right. <laughs> wearing their robes, um, trousers, turbans, and other clothes were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of fire killed the soldiers who took Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and these three men, firmly tied, fell into the furnace. Oh my God. What happens next? The, then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw the fire had not harmed their body, nor was a hair on their head singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel. This is Nebuchadnezzar talking, people. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore... I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego will be cut into pieces and their houses burned into piles of rubble, for no other God can save in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. What a story. 
What an amazing story. It was so interesting. One year in our vacation, <clears throat> that team. And Sunday, the kids were coming up to the front after Bible school was over to act out some of that. And it just so happened, you know, Bible school takes place in the summer, typically, and um, the air conditioner went out that day. <laughs> we kind of felt like we were starting into this fiery furnace, but it, it was fine. But it was really interesting. But here we have this great story. And imagine with me the, the image that God, I mean, that Nebuchadnezzar erected of himself, 90 feet high and 9 feet wide. Oh, my gosh. And he created a worship service around all of this, complete with rousing music, and all were required to bow down and worship this idol. My goodness. If you didn't do it, punishment was to be basically getting burned up in a fiery furnace. Our three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were quietly going about their own business, not taking part in the worship, but also not picketing or causing a problem. But they got tattled on. In Hebrew, the word was the Chaldeans, quote, ate their pieces. In other words, took a bite out of them. Probably because, either because they were just simply Jews or because they had been treated with some leadership favor by the king and were, they were jealous of them. But Nebuchadnezzar was furious with rage when he was told. It was a personal affront to who he was and to his amazing self-aggrandizement. How dare they not follow his instructions? And so, of course, he calls them in, challenges them. Could it be true? Did you really not do this? I'll give you another chance. And they were like, no, we're not doing this. Your threat means nothing to us. We're going to just worship our God. He's going to save us. And if by chance he doesn't, that's okay too, because we belong to him. We'll be with him forever. So, tossed him into the fire. And then he watched. Ooh, he watched them. And instead of being burned up, they walked around unbound with another image, another person in there with them, the four of them, God himself. So then he brought them out. He realized that their God had saved them. And so he offered punishment to anyone who said anything negative about their God. It's not that he so much personally changed, as we see as this story continues, but he knew there was truth there. So imagine with me, 90 feet high, 9 feet wide. What's this? What, 15 maybe? 15 feet high? Something like this here? 90 feet high. That is really tall. Really tall. And gold. Or gilded, at least. Stack in those days, but this one was exceptional. He thought he was worth every ounce of gold and every inch of height. Just imagine this really, really tall statue that everyone was being forced to bow down to when the harp, the lyre, the flute, the zither, everything started playing. You had to fall and bow before the statue. But let's imagine that a golden statue is standing in the middle of your life, our lives. There's a big golden statue, and as you get closer to it, I like to imagine little, little windows. Um, when I was a kid, we grew up with advent calendars. I don't know if people still do them anymore, but I know Starbucks sells them. You can get little drawers and put little treats in them for every day. And mine was, ours were little windows that opened. And there were different sayings or different things inside, little exciting things. We couldn't wait to open the next window. Well, imagine a whole side of a gold statue that had the little windows in it. Because I think that we have statues in our lives too, but we hide our idols behind the little windows. We would never be so crass or obvious to worship a big golden statue. So we hide ours. They look better. Culture says they're okay. But let's look behind some of these windows. When we start out as kids, we want approval, we want to win, we go for the best grades, we go for the best soccer, soccer team, medals, trophies, etc. 
And then we go into the birthday party. We get the most people to come. We have the most friends. We go to the right school. We get the right job. We get the right house. We begin to worship those kinds of things. And I don't know, you can fill in the blank what is behind your little windows. Even at my age, we are, my, my age people have their things too. Maybe careers may be ending, but retirement's still important. How many trips you take? You should see on Facebook, my friends. What trips are we taking? How many things of my grandchildren can I show? I mean, it's just the same. We're just older. <laughs> but, uh, but it's still those idols, those things that make me something if I have them. So how do we know what an idol is in our own lives? These are some questions to ask. How much do I think about it? How much do I worry about it? How much do I pay for it? How concerned am I that it will be taken away? Do you find that you're more concerned about it than being faithful to God? Does the thing keep you from time with God, with your family, with yourself? Does it influence how you make decisions based on keeping that idol in place rather than on what you think God wants? James Fowler wrote a book called Stages of Faith, and he talks about three different levels of, of um, patterns of faith. And one, the, the polytheist is one who these people never bring all of their passion or energy to one value or idea. They worship a lot of things. So this is the person who excels in sports, who has a lot of money, who wants all the toys, who drives a great car, and they never can really decide on, and even they may have a God bucket too, you know, it's kind of which bucket is everything in. But there's, they're all kind of equal. And then the henotheist is one where it's as if one of the, so, so let's imagine our gold thing with the little windows. Lots of windows are open on that one. The henotheist, there's one open at a time, but it changes. So when you're young, it may be popularity you may worship, or then you get older, it may be career or money. You get older than that, it could be health and well-being. In fact, they've done. They, I looked up um, what the top goals from the website, website ranker, and the top goal in life is to be happy, and then to be healthy, and to enjoy life, to achieve intellectual growth, Pursuing ideals and passions, having financial freedom, friendships, caring for others, self-knowledge, emotional, and it goes on and on and on. And finally, at about 70, it's having faith in God. Oh my gosh, we have lots of little windows, and they open and close and open and close depending on where we are in our lives. But the third type of faith pattern is a radical monotheist, and this is the person like Shadrach, Meshach. Abednego, the ones who can say, no, God Almighty is the king of my universe. Not that those things are bad. I don't worship them. I don't worship the idols. I worship the Lord God Almighty. And that's what they were able to do in this time of great challenge and tribulation. How do we do that? We want that, or at least we want to want that. We want to have God at the center of our worship. We come in here, and you guys do a great job of providing beautiful music and beautiful prayer and good sermons. And you come, and you come, to, and you do things that G to G, is that it? You come together in fellowship, and you nurture and develop one another. And I just think that you do it well, except that sometimes we don't. And then sometimes you hit a big challenge where there's this luring, tempting idol coming at you and you don't have the power to resist it. How did Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, how were they able to resist? Well, the first thing is that they're faithful in the everyday things. We know from chapters 1 and 2 that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel stayed faithful to the worship and celebration and lifestyle that was required for them for their worship of God. They stayed faithful every day. It wasn't a big thing. They just ate the right food, for instance. They took care of themselves. They had their times of prayer and worship. So, Worship of Jesus Christ, of God Almighty, um, presumes a relationship with him. Otherwise, you really are going to be worshiping a lot of other stuff. So the first thing to reflect about is, do I know Jesus? And have I asked him to come in to take residence in my heart and to be the king of my world? 
Not a gold statue, or not the little things that we do in worship, but God wants to come in and have a relationship with you. And so that's the first thing. And then we just live into that every day with disciplines and practices and ways to engage in a life of faith through prayer and Bible reading and Bible study and Sunday school and small groups and reflection and silence. And those are the everyday things we do to build ourselves into this relationship with God so that we are ready to worship him. The second thing that they did was they just stood firm. Ooh, that's hard. That's hard to do in the face of, in their case, being thrown into a fiery furnace and maybe getting burned to a crisp. In our case, it's probably not that graphic, but you might have a rejection from somebody if you don't do such and so. If you don't post enough cool stuff on your Facebook, people might drop you. That's a consequence. So what are the consequences that you're facing where you need to stand firm? I had a friend who was a school teacher, and um, remember, you know, praying at the flagpole that came became popular several years ago and she was early on a teacher in her school and so she against the rules of the school met the kids early before school started but it was on school property and that was the rule part because this was a, a citywide thing and so she did that and they had prayer and she got in a in a bunch of trouble for it she stood firm you have to decide how that's going to work in your life and what it's calling you, how he's calling you to stand firm. The third thing they did was they trusted that God would be with them no matter what. It doesn't always turn out great, and they knew that they could have gotten burned up, but they knew also that the God of all creation would be with them. Uh, when we used to do baptisms in one of the churches I served, we would use this verse, Romans 14, 8. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. That's what we would say over every baby, child, adult who was baptized. If we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. And we had one family that wouldn't let the minister say that because they were worried that if they mentioned the fact that this baby might die, that would be bad luck. We've got to own that. Whether we live or whether we die, we belong to Jesus. He's got this, people. And that's the one that we worship. So worship, the ways we give ourselves to the God of the universe who loves us more than we can imagine. Our call is to come into his presence and fall on our faces, figuratively or or real in reality, and worship him, to give him access, access, good name for a church, access to everything about our lives, every hidden door, every, every hidden thought, every raw and hurting place. And as we lay ourselves open and worship him, it's an act of trust that says, I believe that you will be with me whether I live or whether I die and that you will come inside and you will restore me to wholeness and use me in your kingdom work. Last year when I preached here, and I guess it was in March, I told you about my, and many of you were not here, but my first husband um, died of cancer in 1991, was um, a minister as well. We were ministers together, and he, we were at a denominational meeting, and he was really sick. He had an oxygen machine, and he was, you knew he, and he died three months later. But we were examining a candidate for election, and he said to, um, he stood up from the back and asked this candidate this question, what is your only comfort in life and in death? And of course, everybody knew that Tom was about to die, so it was very poignant. And this poor young seminarian <laughs> was just stunned. That is the first question, and he answered it well, but the first question of the Heidelberg Catechism, which is one of the confessions of the Reformation, the answer to that goes in this catechism what is your only comfort in life and in death? That I am not my own, but I belong, body and soul, in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. 
He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. Because I belong to him, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. Let us pray. Holy God, you are the God of the universe, all-powerful. We ask that you would strike us in the heart today to bring all of ourselves to worship you. May we invite you to come in, Holy Spirit, with your breath, and reveal to us the things that we do worship that aren't you. Now, God, we know that some of these are good and right things to have in our lives, but we confess that sometimes we elevate them to the place of worship. So we ask your forgiveness. We ask that you would remind us that you are our God and our King. So I pray that we would worship you in all truth, giving you glory and honor. And thank you for the grace that you promised to us. In Jesus' name, amen.